Hello, welcome to the CCNA preparation guide brought to you by Eduonix. We're still on chapter 4, which is the IP routing technologies. Uh, we're going to have a look at um, some of these things here. Uh, mainly, I think we're looking at link state versus distance vector and some next hop. So distance vector routing is, uh, is so named because it involves two factors. It involves the distance or the metric of a destination and the vector or the direction to take in order to get there. The routing information is only exchanged between directly connected neighbours as well. This means that routers know from which neighbour a route was learned, but it doesn't know that the neighbour learned the route. The router can't see beyond its own neighbours. And this aspect of distance vector routing is sometimes referred to as routing by rumour. Measures like split horizon and poison reverse are employed to avoid any kind of routing loops. And when we talk about link state routing, in contrast, it requires that all routers known, sorry, know about the paths um, reachable by all other routers in the network. Link state information is flooded throughout the link state domain uh, in area in OSPF or ISIS to ensure all routers possess a, a synchronized copy of the area's link state database. From this common database, each router constructs its own relative shortest path tree with itself as the route for uh, all known routes. So if you look at the topology here, both distant vectors and link state routing protocols are suitable for deployment on this network, uh, but each will go about propagating routes in a different manner. So if we were to run a distance vector routing protocol like RIP or EIGRP on this topology, um, this is how router one would see the network, assuming that each link has a metric of one, such as locally connected routes have been emitted. Do we notice that although router one has connectivity to all subnets, it has no knowledge of the network structure beyond its own network cost of one. So the one of cost of two there, the 10.04.0 slash 24 network, it has no knowledge of and these images are taken from packet life. So because they don't require routers to maintain the state of all links in the network, Distance vector protocols typically consume less overhead at the expense of limited visibility. Because routers have only a limited view of the network, tools like split horizon and poison reverse are needed to stop the routing loops that we talked about before. So now let's look at the same topology um, running, sorry, different topology running link state routing protocol in a single area. Because each router records the state of the links in the area, each router can construct a shortest path tree from itself to all known destinations. And uh, the, the route and path tree there would look almost identical to the other one, except they would have every single network in there. So router 4 here has constructed its own shortest path tree that's different from router 1 and although maintaining link state information for the entire area typically requires more overhead um, than does um, processing advertisements only from direct neighbours but it does provide a more robust operation and scalability as well. So the ability to configure a static route was introduced um, in the Cisco IOS software release number 10. Static routes are used for a variety of reasons and are often used when there are no dynamic routes to the destination or when you run a dynamic routing protocol and it's not feasible. By default, static routes have an administrative distance of 1 which gives them the precedence over uh, routes from dynamic routing protocols. When you increase the administrative distance to a value greater than that of a dynamic routing protocol, the static route can be a safety net in the event that dynamic routing fails. For example, um, interior gateway protocol IGRP derived routes have a default administrative distance of 100. In order to configure a static route that is overridden by IGRP routes, 
you need to specify an administrative distance of anything greater than 100. This kind of static root is called a floating static and it's installed in the routing table only when the preferred root disappears. For example, IP root uh, 172.16.0.0 on a slash 24. Um, so if you, if you note that the administrative distance of um, 255 is considered unreachable by static routes, you need to set your route to something like 101 or 102 if, if it has to be greater than 100. And if you point a static route to a broadcast interface, then the route um, is inserted into the routing table only when the broadcast interface is up. This configuration isn't recommended because when the next hop of a static route points to an interface, the router considers each of the, the hosts within the range of the route to be directly connected through the interface. For example, IP route 0000, .00 sorry, 0000 on Ethernet 0. With this type of configuration, a router performs an address resolution protocol, or an ARP, on the Ethernet for every destination the router finds through the default route because the router considers all the destinations as directly connected to E0. This kind of default route, especially if it's used by a lot of packets to maintain um, its destinations, can cause high processor utilization and a very large ARP cache, along with um, uh, attendant memory failures, allocation failures, that kind of thing. Specifying a numerical next hop on the directly connected interface prevents the router from performing ARP or, um, oh, sorry, of each destination address. However, if, if the interface with the next hop goes down and the numerical next hop is reachable through a reverse route, you should specify both the next hop IP address and the interface through which the next hop is found. For example, IP address 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 and then after that you would have to have something like serial 33 or gigabit ethernet 11 after it or something like that just to actually give it you know a destination uh, of where to go